Linda, who needs an actual real desk chair in her study at home. I'm sitting in one of those kind of director chair sort of things that um, my partner Mike has because he's a musician. And a long story. Anyway, it's like, oh, it's just killing my back. I get out someplace and buy a chair. Yeah, I, I had to go back to our, my back. So. I know we have all these chairs that, you know, look nice, but aren't comfortable. So yeah, I had to go get, go to the office a couple months ago to get. <laughs> That's about what I need to go to the office and grab my office chair. Yeah. Thank you everybody for um, coming into the room here. We'll start in a minute or two. We'll just uh, continue to let all the attendees uh, fill up the room here. So Steve, I won't see the chat box while my PowerPoint is open. So okay. you're gonna I, have to let me know if questions pop in. So Yep. All right, I'm gonna Hello Madeline. All right, we're uh I know we'll have more additional people join, but I'll uh, just kick us off, Linda, if you're ready. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, this beautiful Thursday afternoon at three o'clock. Uh, I know the sun's uh, shining and we appreciate you being here uh, with us. Uh, this is, uh, my name is Steve Jabbing. I'll be our moderator today. Um, this is the Lansing Regional Chamber of Commerce, the relaunch uh, Greater Lansing webinar series. And we have a few of these that are um, gonna be going out. We'll be sending those out to all the attendees today. Um, but uh, our first, uh, a webinar is with Linda Vale, who's the health officer of the Ingham County Health Department. Um, Linda's going to go through and talk about um, PPE, social distancing, contact tracing, kind of everything in between and, and uh, what you need to know to, to run your business or organization, nonprofit, whatever that may be, to make sure that we're uh, providing a safe environment, not only for, for your place of uh, um, where you work and for your employees and customers and visitors. So this is a reminder, this is a webinar format. So everybody's on mute. Uh, we cannot see your video, so don't worry. Um, you may ask questions. Linda's uh, gonna be able to an answer questions. I'm gonna help her in the chat box, um, answer those throughout the program, but we, we will also have an opportunity at the end uh, for any questions. Um, this uh, webinar is being recorded and that will be sent out um, following uh, this program. When, um, other than that, um, thank you again for uh, being with us today. And uh, Linda, the uh, space is yours. I'm gonna hide my video and uh, good luck. Oh, well, thank you, Steve. <clears throat> I do wanna thank the Chamber for the relaunch uh, Greater Lansing effort that they started. This was not something we asked them to do, but they started um, and, and basically just a great partnership in, in them coming to the health department. You know, the health department and the chamber aren't always working together on everything, but we, we've worked together a lot on things. Um, but they've really been working side by side with us to help, you know, all of the businesses, like you said, agencies, nonprofits, et cetera, um, with all of the various information that you might need um, as you start up. So I hope not to, bar, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, bore you by PowerPoint. But here we go. Um, so we want to talk about personal protective equipment, PPE, social distancing for your business, and also a little bit about contact tracing. So to start with, I just want you to know that there, I'm going to go through some of these resources, but there are a number of resources on our website for you. So our main um, coronavirus page that just has everything you want to go to is that first link at the top. 
Then below that, there are a bunch of printer ready fact sheets, flyers, signage, things that can, you can use that will help you. And I'm gonna go through some of those. We actually have some audio files in several languages on our website as well. And I call attention to the last link, which is our Ingham County emergency orders. I do have the authority as a local health officer to enact orders that are different from uh, the state, never more lenient than the state, sometimes stricter than the state, and you've seen me do that. Um, with any luck, we won't have to do it again, but if you ever need to find an emergency order, they are right there. So first I wanna, like I said, I'm gonna walk you through some of the things that are available on our website that you can use as flyers, you can bring into your businesses, um, and these are all printer ready available on our website. So here is just a basic, we did this very early on, coronavirus, you know, COVID-19 information fact sheet, you know, preventing by washing your hands, staying home if you're sick, cleaning surfaces, close contact, um, using face coverings, and then just some basics about symptoms. Now, of course, we know a little bit more about symptoms now than we did uh, back when we created this fact sheet, but still primarily fever, um, cough, most importantly, newer worsening cough and shortness of breath do still tend to be the primary symptoms, although you know we have seen some other things like loss of taste and smell and things like that that go with it as well. Um, so we have these fact sheets. The other thing I will show you is that a number of these fact sheets are available in multiple languages. In this particular case, I pulled a Spanish one for you. So tips for prevention, again, just you know, easy flyers for you to use, easy um, ha handouts, fact sheets for, your, for people. Again, tips for prevention, which we mentioned in the other one, which is you know, very wordy and has lots of information. And if you need to break it down, then you know, we're kind of breaking it down into different um, aspects of prevention and those sorts of things. So that's that fact sheet. Um, we also have a fact sheet about social distancing. Um, and this one I also show to you in Arabic. So we keep distances of six feet apart. We give some nice graphics there to help you understand that. Um, also always taking you back to our hd.ingham.org coronavirus site, which is where all of this information is, and, and as well as a lot of other information. That's where we put our dashboard as well as our daily updates um, with um, in kind of a PDF PowerPoint format with regard to the data and what's going on in our community. So when we talk about social distancing in your businesses, so let's talk about social distancing first since I just put that one out there. There are a number of ways to help you with that. Um, you know, all I did was go online and kind of Google for you here. You can put um, signage up, you can put markings on the floor, um, these are some of the many ways, you know, just something as simple as a, you know, a chalk circle sometimes, um, but there's a lot available out there. Again, you can do that in different languages or well, or multiple languages on the same thing, um, on the same sign. But, you know, you see these out, these are very effective things, especially if you're, a, you know, a kind of business, like I went to a Verizon store yesterday because my phone has decided that this is a great time to quit working on me. And, um, you know, outside on the sidewalk in front were these you know, circles keeping people that six feet apart. So that is a tool that you can use and help you, whether it's outside your business or inside your business, if you're the type of business that is retail or something like that, trying to wait on people that is a cash register or outside trying to keep too many people in from coming into your store at one time. Um, in addition to that, with social distancing, there are times where you cannot keep that six foot distance. And that's where um, you might be seeing in the grocery stores or Lowe's. You see here a restaurant where um, somebody is, is about to serve some, I don't know what, that they weighed soup or something that's over there. So plexiglass shields. Um, you might have office environments where people you know, need to work closer together or you don't have that spacing and the addition of plexiglass shields. But again, those are the places where you interact with people or you have workers working together that may not be able to stay six feet apart. Let's add that plexiglass shield in there as a mechanism of protection because we cannot keep that six foot distance. We have a wash your hands uh, 
sign that is in multiple languages right on the sign. So basically the uh, wash your hands is the most effective way. Soap and water is the most effective way to wash your hands. Um, washing your hands for 20 seconds. I usually say with water as hot as your hands can stand. Um, so better with hot water than cold water, better with water and soap, um, no matter what the temperature of the water is, than nothing at all. Hand sanitizer is a great alternative if there is not immediate access to uh, soap and water. So you wanna keep those things available any place that you can. There's a lot of those automatic dispensers where you just put your hand under it and then you can do that. So um, I know supply chain was difficult at, at many points in time with regard to getting hand sanitizer as well as the things like the dispensers that I'm talking about. But the supply chain is starting to flow a whole lot better now um, as things are calming down a little bit and the, the hoarding has stopped. And so you should be able to get hand sanitizer as well. Um, this is a very wordy, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but good thing to, it, it wouldn't be a good sign for you to put up, but this is a good thing to use for, um, you know, a, a fact sheet, a handout for folks. Because one of the things I was concerned about as we, as we pivoted towards um, mask wearing away from you don't need a mask and um, just trust me, it's been difficult to be a health officer in this time where the guidance changes every day, sometimes by the hour, sometimes by the minute. And you have to kind of figure out how to, how to deal with that. My, my medical director and I said many a time, it's like, well, I'm gonna say this today, but I might have to walk it back tomorrow. And I still am probably in, in that uh, kind of position. So um, really important in wearing these masks, these cloth masks that are gonna be get, get reused. So masks are typically used in a medical environment. When we get done with them, we throw them away, done. You know, you don't wear them over and over again. The cloth masks are something that people are reusing and it's great. It's keeping the medical masks appropriately in the medical environment. We have to take care of them properly. So the first thing you wanna do is wash your hands before you put on the mask. Once you put on the mask, you want it to cover your mouth and your nose, right? And you wanna to try to make sure there's no gaps. If it has ties, you wanna put that tie on the crown of your head and then at the nape of your neck. If you tie them both right behind the back of your head, it will slip and fall, it will not stay on properly, it will have too many gaps. Another important thing to do is not to just let the mask hang on your neck or off your face or something like that when you are um, you know, wanting to take it off. So you know, letting that mask then just slip down on your neck is not a good idea. So proper care of the mask. Don't touch the mask while it's on your face. Um, if you know, we're wearing masks right now in, in the case or the possibility that we may be um, asymptomatic or what we would call pre-symptomatic, you're about to get sick but you don't know yet, and if that's the case, there's virus collecting on the outside of that mask. And in fact, science shows more on the outside than the inside. So if you are indeed, you know, breathing out, exhaling droplets that have virus on them, they're really collecting right there. And your mask is becoming essentially a, a little Petri dish, which, you know, if you're the one that's sick, that doesn't matter. You're already sick anyway. But if you then start touching it and touching surfaces, you're contaminating a lot of surfaces. So don't touch the mask. Wash your hands. Um, and, and here's where it says, don't hang it from your neck or off of one ear. When you want to remove the mask, you want to lean forward and again, carefully get it off so you're not basically contaminating your hands or your face while you're taking it off. Don't touch your face or the part of mask that covers your face. Then we either dispose of the mask if it's a disposable one, or we wash it. It's important to wash that mask, especially, you know, if you're just wearing it incidentally for maybe, you know, a quick trip to, to pay for something at a convenience store or the gas store and you've only worn it for a few minutes, I don't think you really need to clean it at that point. But a lot of people are going to be wearing these, you know, a, a large part of the day or maybe the whole day. And so you have to, again, remember I told you, if you are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, you're collecting a little Petri dish on the mask. You keep putting it on and then it's just gonna to continue to collect and collect more virus for the period of time that it can survive. There is some science that says that the virus will survive on the outside of a mask, a medical mask for up to seven days. 
So very important that we wash those in hot water and then preferably dry them. Um, I know, you know, if you're me, my washing machine is pretty big to just throw one tiny mask in it. So I don't have any problem with uh, hot water and, you know, washing it under hot water with soap and then drying it. Um, but ideally you do want to wash it in some way, shape or form. And then again, once you have the mask off and the mask is clean, now you need to wash your hands again. And that keeps your environment as you come home after wearing that mask or if, as you know, you're in your workplace um, from, from getting contaminated by your own hands. So these are the kinds of masks that are available. Up in the top corner over there, you see an N95 mask. Uh, please don't use those. Those are really, really critical for our healthcare workers to have, um, in, especially in ICUs and when they're dealing with patients that they do know have virus. That is the mask that will filter out um, basically virus particles, 95% um, of virus particles at like 0.3 or 3 microns, I forget the number. Next to that is a, uh, a medical or a procedure mask. It really does, you know, similar to what the cloth masks that we will talk about do. It one, for somebody wearing it in the medical environment, keeps droplets and blood splattering and things like that from getting on their face. Um, but again, protects or stops that, you know, potentially infectious, you know, whatever that might be on the outside. So we've gotten really clever about cloth masks. So you see a number of cloth masks here um, that are being made, they're being sold now. Um, you know, I think, I think it's really quite interesting that before Americans wore masks, masks were just masks, but now that Americans are wearing masks, they're just all kinds of fun. You know, we get logos, we get colors, we get animals, we get cow prints, have fun with the mask. Um, the one, the one up there is loop mask. So you're seeing some like the black one. There are also these things that are kind of like a, a neck, you know, a neck gaiter thing that you just pull up over your face, which of course is counter what, to what I just told you about not, you know, putting it on your neck, but nonetheless they exist. And then you can see over here, um, you can even go online and buy your favorite Spartan masks um, in whatever logo or whatever. And if you don't happen to be a Spartan fan, they're out there in every name, way, shape, or form, football teams, of the professional, you name it, there's a mask out there for it. Um, we do sometimes encounter people who are not medically able to wear masks. And I've been asked, okay, what about people that are not medically able to wear masks? Um, a shield. So here is a face shield um, being worn by someone. And so that can be a good alternative if somebody has a medical reason not to wear a mask. In the healthcare environment, we do both. We wear the mask and the shield. Um, but the, again, we're not talking about the medical environment. And I do believe that we have some local folks that have been repurposing some of their manufacturing and have created um, some shields like this. And I'm sure Steve can help you find out who that is and, and where to get access to this kind of thing. So that is an alternative for people who, who have medical reasons that, that keep them from being able to wear masks. As you, as you can see, it would be a little bit easier to breathe um, for somebody like an asthmatic that has problems breathing with a cloth mask on. So should I stop right there for a minute? I saw some, I saw some hand raising and stuff there, Steve. Yeah, I um, did have some questions. It's just a good, just good place to stop right here. So yeah. Section. Sure. So I'll, uh, I'll ask kind of the first question here. If you um, if you can social distance and or say um, you put up a sneeze guard, plexiglass barrier, does that employee behind the barrier need to wear a mask? Okay. Um, no. Y yes and no. I mean, the more layers of protection you put in place, the better. Okay. So the plexiglass is going up, like it is required in the, in the food supply industry. So restaurants and pharmacies, plexiglass shield or not, if they're working at a counter, they are required to wear masks. Um, the addition of the, the plexiglass shield is helpful in the case that maybe you have a customer that's not wearing a mask. So that adds that additional protection there um, because that mask is not necessarily filtering out what's coming in. The mask you're wearing is to help what's What's, what's potentially coming out of you. 
So um, in the workplace, you know, if you're in your office, if you are in a office space that's, you know, away from the public, um, you know, I won't wear a mask in my office. I have a mask, an office all to myself. But it is required in our business that if you get anywhere out into a common area, if anybody comes into my office, then we're wearing masks. So it does add an extra layer of protection to do both. But it's yeah, going to depend on your environment. Okay. Yeah, that was the um, question pertaining to the presentation right now. So that's good. Is that it for now? Yep. Okay. Other PPE. Gloves, gowns. So here's what I'm going to tell you about gloves and gowns. You do not need gloves. You do not need gowns. Might be obvious that you not need gowns, but gloves. Here's the way gloves work in a laboratory like I used to work in or a medical environment like we're talking about. Every time you use, you do something with those gloves on, you take them off and you put on a new pair. You see it in your doctor's offices. They put that, those gloves on, they do your, and then they take those gloves off. If you put on a pair of gloves and go through the grocery store, or if you put on a pair of gloves, you know, because I'm gonna be handling mail or, and, and honestly, the mail is not a worry in my office, and then you just keep wearing them, then they, all they are now is your hands, right? They're the same as your hands. Every surface you touch after you've touched any one surface with those gloves on now is contaminated potentially. And anytime you touch your face, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, you're still contaminating your eyes, your nose, your mouth. You still have the potential of introducing that virus into your mouth. So unless you are taking off gloves rapid, rapidly in any kind of environment you're in, they are no different than your own hands. So that's what I have to say about gloves. Um, this is, again, we get to some uh, fact sheets and handouts. We will be entering flu season again come fall, um, and we will no doubt have COVID-19 around again still fall, um, hopefully not in any kind of a giant second wave. So this is something that helps people tell the difference between, you know, do I have COVID-19? Do I have a cold? Do I have a flu? Um, I've seen one like this that also has allergies on it, but this is the one that we have available on our website. Um, again, you know, I just encourage you to use the signage, to use these, you know, handouts, these fact, these flyers, just, just, uh, you know, in your, you know, your em environments for your employees, so that people just have, you know, all of this information. Um, we have a fact sheet for prevention in apartment housing. So for the renter um, and for the employees. So the landlord and the people that work there. So how do we manage in apartment housing? So some of you may be landlords or, or, um, or uh, you know, otherwise. So these fact sheets are available to you on our website for um, helping you with prevention in apartment housing. Um, apartment housing often involves some fairly close contact. Um, it's, it's often, you know, fairly common that you can't go out your door if somebody else is coming out the door at the same time and stay six feet away from them. Uh, so uh, apartment housing, in particular, we were dealing with some um, issues going down on in, in a couple of different apartment complexes where we had some outbreaks. And so these became important for us to get out. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about screening. So this is your workplace screening checklist and your workplace screening form. So um, lots of information here. Uh, screening is, is required. The governor's order said um, that you have to, at a minimum, screen for symptoms and uh, possible or known exposure. The order itself doesn't tell you what symptoms to check for or anything. So this is our guide here. Um, it is not the rule. It is not, you know, it is just what we think is a very, very good guidance. So new or worsening cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, breathing, a fever of 100.4 or over, and that is a do not go to work. Then we go into another set of symptoms where we say if you have two or more of the following, then you shouldn't go to work. Because as you can imagine, um, I often have headaches <laughs> these days. Um, 
So a headache, you know, there are people with irritable bowel syndrome that might have diarrhea on a regular basis. Um, you know, there are any number of things that can be, you know, going on that shouldn't necessarily cause somebody to need to be screened out of work. And then the next question is, have you had close contact with somebody diagnosed with COVID-19? So that is a workplace screening form. We also have signage for people entering your building. So stop, only enter the building if you have appointment or a healthy visitor or employee. Um, stop for a health screening. Depending on what you're gonna do with screening, you may only screen your employees. You may choose to screen the public too. We can do that. We will be doing that in our building and I know the courthouses will as well. Um, we have developed, and I'm gonna switch screens here. I told you I wouldn't do this, Steve, but I do wanna do it with this one. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing there. And then I'm gonna reshare here. So we have developed for Ingham County and we are working with the chamber to make this available to employers throughout the region. Um, so we're working with Michigan State University as well as the chamber to develop a tool like this. Lansing Community College has already developed their own. So what would happen is you could have your employees just have a site like this. And when we create a site, then you know, we'll share it with you. And then all they have to do is go, I've got a newer worsening cough um, or I have shortness of breath. If I click on any of these and then click this check, it's gonna tell me don't report to work, notify my supervisor and consult my medical professional. If I click that I have a headache, which I frequently do these days, <laughs> it's gonna tell me I can report to work. It's just one symptom. Right, so I can report to work. Also note that it's gonna give me a date and a timestamp so that, so that I know, you know that I did that today. If I mark um, muscle aches and a sore throat, it's gonna say, don't report to work. Notify your supervisor, consult your medical professional. And then we've got this last one up here. It says, have you had close contact with someone with a diagnosis of COVID-19 in the last 14 days? Now that one's gonna tell you, consult your supervisor for further direction. And depending on what slide it, it's, I have it in, I will explain that to you. The idea here would be that somebody would do it on their mobile device. And instead of you having to you know, stand at your door screening people coming in, you know, all they would have to do is show that to you. Um, or screenshot it and then show it to you. So basically they show up and they have, um, let's get rid of these. You can report to work. It's like, here's Linda at 6-11-2020 at 3.27 p.m. has a green, I can report to work. All I have to do is show you that and off we go. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. And unfortunately it lost where I was, but I can find it real quick, I promise you. Here we go. Um, there we go. So next, what is contact tracing? And eventually I'll get back to that question that I know you're all you know, begging to ask me about that uh, um, exposure and consult your supervisor for further direction. So what is contact tracing? Um, social distancing, contact tracing, self-monitoring isolation. We have a fact sheet for that too. So we have a fact sheet for self-monitoring. We have a fact sheet for quarantine and monitoring quarantine. We have a fact sheet for isolation. Who should do it? What is it? You know, what individuals can do, what businesses can do. You might even be able to create just like a little booklet of all of these things. So contact tracing is um, notification to us that there is a positive case. From that point, we determine an exposure period because just because there's a positive case doesn't mean there was exposure in any given place to that person. We need to back out 48 hours before they became symptomatic and that's the period of time we consider them transmissible. So if they, if, if they got symptomatic on a Monday morning and weren't in the office, um, over the weekend, then basically the Friday before is now going to be, you've got an employee that's positive, but you, you've got no exposure in your workplace because we've gone back 48 hours from the onset of symptoms. And so nobody's been exposed to this case. That's how we determine that. 
The other thing we determine is relative risk of anyone who might have been in contact with that person. Um, it does require some fairly close, fairly prolonged contact for it to be really risk. So, you know, when somebody is like, for example, coming into a courthouse and a security person is there, might be wearing a mask, probably will be, and all they do is pass by, and then we learn that person is COVID positive. We did have a case like this. You know, that's not really a risk because that was such a short incidental contact. So those are the kinds of things that we work out. We then reach out to the context of that positive case, and we start talking to them about whether they're symptomatic. Um, and then we tell them, you've been exposed, you should quarantine for 14 days. And we'll get back to that contact thing I keep promising you later. When we get a hold of those contacts, if one of them is also symptomatic, we now have to start contacting the contacts of that contact. So what's next? After we do that, we determine that somebody needs to be quarantined because they've been exposed. Quarantine means you're exposed, but you have no symptoms. Isolation is for those who are symptomatic. So those are two different words in our world. They mean two completely different things. People who are quarantined are not sick. We're just trying to keep them out of the general environment until we know that they're not going to become sick. Isolation is for those who are symptomatic. We know they're sick. Actually, they may have tested positive and been asymptomatic in the case of this particular illness, and then they isolate for a period of time. Quarantine guidance is still currently 14 days from the date of exposure. Isolation guidance goes like this, 10 days. So if you're only sick for three days, you're still gonna have to isolate for 10 days. And it has to do with what we call viral shedding. In other words, a virus is still coming out of your body for a period of time, even after you are over your symptoms. So the other would be 72 hours after symptoms resolve. So let's say you were sick for 12 days. Now we have to go another three days beyond the resolution of those symptoms. And you have to have no fever without using fever reducing medication. The other isolation guidance or you know, getting done with isolation is two negative COVID-19 tests. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that is highly problematic. I would discourage any employers from wanting employees to have COVID tests that prove that they're negative in order to let them come back to work. If you do that, you may find that your employees are gone for 30 to 60 days. In our, in our world, we don't consider them in trans, you know, transmitting or infectious for that period of time. It just takes a period of time for that test to come out negative. Uh, the PCR test that they use for COVID-19 can find one basically molecule of this virus, amplify it and say you have the virus. So it doesn't, it, that's the way that the test works and I know that because I used to do it in the laboratory. So um, that is basically symptom-based, time-based or test-based strategies for discontinuing isolation. So more on exposure and quarantine. Back to the question that I told you I would answer. So you have some discretion for employees who have known exposure. So how can that be? I thought isolation and quarantine were critical to avoid this second wave, right? Well, sorry about this. Um, imagine my employees. They are healthcare employees. They're going to be exposed to people who have COVID-19. First responders are going to be exposed to people with COVID-19. There are, you know, just sometimes the context of our work is going to expose us to COVID-19. So the same guidelines that we would use for people who we know are, are probably just because of the nature of their work are going to be exposed are guidelines that you could use as well for your exposed but not symptomatic employees. So rather than that 14 days you can't come to work, you can make sure that that employee's temperature, measure that employee's temperature and assess symptoms each day prior to them starting work and before entering the facility. As long as they don't have symptoms, a fever, they should self-monitor under the supervision of your occupational health program or other programs that you might have in place, excuse me, to protect employee health or safety. 
If the employee becomes sick during the workday, they should be sent home immediately. Uh, wow, everything displays differently when you go into slideshow mode. So if you choose to allow the employee to come to work continued, um, the employee should wear a face mask at all times while in the workplace for 14 days after that exposure. You can issue that face mask. You can approve an, uh, of an employee's face covering in the event of shortages. That employee now really should really work towards maintaining that six foot distance and social distancing as work duties permit. Um, beyond standard cleaning protocols, which you're all going to enhance, um, we want to clean and disinfect all areas such as offices, bathroom, common areas, shared electronic equipment routinely known to be impacted by the exposed employee for that 14 days after the last exposure. I will fix this bad formatting before I send it to all of you as a PDF. So I'm just going to end that by I, I would do a disservice to uh, talking about this pandemic without also acknowledging that uh, you know we're living through a time and a tipping point in history where uh, racism and COVID-19 and COVID-19 shining a light on disparities in health that we've long known in public health. Um, but many, many things are coming to you know a convergence all at the same time. And so we do know that racism is a public health crisis and that basically it is going to take the collective action of all of us, um, anti-racist action, to find solutions and heal. You know, we need to stand in solidarity with our neighbors and our colleagues are Black, and we need to be committed to working with them to cultivate equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, this is part of a statement that was released by myself and Carol Seaman, our Ingham County prosecutor, and I, I just kind of want to end with that and then allow the questions to begin. Where'd you go, Steve? I'm trying to come back. There we go. Thank you so much, Linda. That was great. Thank you for uh, uh, going through that. That's all. That's a lot of information. So thank you. Um, if uh, I'll start with a question here, and then again for everybody, all the all the attendees, we will be sending this out as well as um, uh, Linda's presentation. Um, and again, the uh, the Ingham uh, County Health Department has fantastic resources. Those are also on uh, on the chambers uh, webpage as well. Um, so here's a question. I have a lot of questions. That's great from another Steve. Um, so I'll. Uh, Sometimes it's tough to kind of read through well, these. But, is Steve, oh, Steve Rosbach? Yeah, go, yep. Okay, um, go ahead. If an employee does end up testing positive, um, no, you don't need to shut down. You can continue to sanitize. Um, we're gonna, we will work with you to identify areas that you might need to particularly pay attention to. Again, it's going to depend on, you might have a big facility. It's going to depend on where that employee was. And that's part of our contact tracing. So our contact tracing not only helps us identify individuals, but when we identify those individuals, we also identify locations. And so you can do some enhanced sanitization and disinfecting of those surfaces, and then um, yeah, work with the employees with the guidelines. Um, the question above that um, is, can employees screen, self-screen using my symptoms? They can. Let me tell you what my hesitation is with that. And that is one, people have to enter their email address in first. Okay, and that's the first thing that happens. A lot of people are very sensitive about where their information is going when they do that. I, as a health officer, would prefer that it gets done over knowing any information about that person. So I know the My Symptom Checker is, you know, helpful in terms of basically doing some surveillance to tell us whether businesses are you know, having any kinds of problems. But that's one of my concerns. If you go through the My Symptom Checker thing, as I did, in my mind, um, because I'm a health officer and I know which questions are important to ask and which ones are not, it asks a lot of questions that don't need to be asked. And then, then the ADD folks like me are just like, I'm done with this now. So it asks you every time, have you had a COVID test in the last 24 hours? I mean, do I need to ask that every day? So yes, you can use it. You 
you will need to be aware of the fact that there might be some drawbacks to that. Uh, the self-screening does meet the state of Michigan requirements. The state of Michigan requirements are for your employees. Um, you are required, all the executive order says is to screen for, at a minimum, symptoms, and I believe it says probable or known exposure. It doesn't say anything about travel anymore. Travel got really weird on us, and so we dropped travel. Um, it does still include travel in the food supply industry. So restaurants, um, grocery stores, pharmacies. I don't know why. Hopefully at some point in time, the state will make it consistent and not have just one sector of business having to screen for travel as well. But currently the executive order over food supply and pharmacies does still also ask you to check for travel. Um, I see one from Daniel here. Is there a two day period when somebody is actually before they show symptoms? I thought it was two weeks. No, it is two days. Um, the reason the 14 day quarantine exists is it sometimes can take 14 days for somebody who has been exposed to become symptomatic. So that's the 14 days you're thinking about. So the 14 days is after exposure where we want to quarantine people so that in case they become symptomatic, they haven't exposed a whole lot of other people during that two day period when they were infectious but not showing symptoms. So the current guidance from the CDC and everywhere else is two days before it was, they've, they've moved that around a little bit, but right now it's 48 hours before. Um, and so the two weeks is the quarantine. Um, I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss earlier questions. There's Madeline saying hello. There's the symptoms. No, yeah, you've, um, you've gotten them all. Uh, have I got uh, them all? Okay. Yep, Steve oh, just yeah. asked another question. We had another one from Steve. Schools in the ISD, can you chat on your personal thoughts on taking temperatures? We're concerned about doing that. We have the direction now from MHSAA that we do not have to do it. So we are doing it with, oh, that we do have to do it. We are doing it with athletes, but worried about taking everyone's temp who comes into the building. Um, if they're saying you have to do it, then you have to do it. Um, is that, that's MH, MHSAA guidelines saying that, I assume, not the state. Um, so, um, you know, s s fever checking is not, um, it's not terrible. I mean, you don't have to take a record of anything. You don't have to do anything like that. I will, I will admit to you this thing. I went to a casino on Sunday. I'm not a gambler. I get bored with gambling. Firekeepers is open for some reason. Friend of mine, you know, gets free entry into the club, so we just went for dinner. Um, but they're, you know, they're using those thermo scans, those no-touch thermometers for everybody coming into that, and everybody in there is a mask, and it's really fast. You know, people walk in, screen, go. So um, I, I understand the worry about taking everybody's temperatures. You certainly need to do it with a no-touch thermometer. If you can't get access to a no-touch thermometer, then absolutely not. I have a question um, from Stephanie. Do you have to record staff responses in child care centers or can you just ask the required questions? You can just ask the required questions. I have actual concerns about, um, you know, the possibility of, you know, of us. These are, this is people's protected health information, right? And, and so you can ask, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody should be keeping records of it. All it is, is a way to let people in the door. Once you've let them in the door, I don't know why you would need to continue to keep that. We certainly aren't going to. Um, there is a certain amount of stigma that has come with this virus, unfortunately. Um, and we know, you know other viruses that have come with stigma associated with them. HIV is one. So, I think we have to be very careful about a virus that, you know, you know, people are very afraid of. They're going to, you know, I've had people like running from buildings because like, oh, I heard so-and-so was in that building and now tested positive. It's like, you know what? You were in that building seven days ago. You need to calm down. So, you know, the information that goes around about people and their symptoms is problematic and unnecessary. And there's no reason that you need to keep records of it. Let's see any other questions right now. If you do have a question, um, now's your Apparently chance. I should have a longer PowerPoint. 
No, it was good. I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you Linda, just in case there's, there are others typing right now um, for questions, but, uh, and I know I asked you this the other day um, and it's hard to probably answer, but what does the fall look like? I know we've seen, you know, the stock market's going down right now. Um, just because I try of, to ignore the stock market. No, I, I know. In my life, so. <laughs> um, but you know, there right now it's kind of going down because there is that that fear of that second wave and what that may look like. So, what does that look like right now for our region? I know you you talked about um, our region is doing um, a very good job, but what does that look like in, in, from your from your lens? Yeah, you know, there are there's a lot of complicating um, factors related to uh, second wave and predicting second wave and all that sort of stuff. Uh, one, we do know that it is a novel virus, which means the human body, the human immune system has never seen it before. So it, it will never like completely go away like a flu does. And then it will, and then, but it should go into kind of a low level rumbling. And then we would expect it to come up in the fall, just like flu does, just like respiratory syncytial virus and other respiratory viruses do. What we want it to do is not get, you know, out of control again. A lot of the reasons we're concerned about the second wave, if you read carefully what the CDC director said when he mentioned being concerned about a big second wave in the fall, um, and headlines are often misleading. So please be aware that headlines from many, many news sources, I've seen bad headlines on NPR, I've seen bad headlines all over the place. Um, if you really read that article, what you saw was, you know, if COVID-19 upticks again, and flu season and the other respiratory viruses that we're going to have all of that happening at the same time and that all put together is you know the overwhelming big wave in our system so yes we could have a covid wave um, what we need people to do is not get complacent after we get to a place where we can kind of go about life again um, you're seeing a lot of people not doing that you know getting in crowded places you know, somebody showed me a picture of a, you know, just crowded line of people trying to get into Harper's Bar um, the other day, stuff like that. And, you know, people have got to, to remain diligent. If we can remain diligent about this, I think we can keep a second wave from overwhelming us. Do expect an uptick in cases, though. That, and that's not necessarily a huge second wave. It's just the nature of it. Um, the other complicating factor is that we really don't know whether COVID-19 or excuse me, SARS-CoV-2, because that's the virus, COVID-19 is the, is the disease. Um, SARS-CoV-2 virus has any seasonality to it. Had it hit say in October instead of March, then we would have seen, because we'd have done our suppression stuff way back then, and we'd have flattened our curve way back then, and then we'd have gone through that few months and we'd come out, and then we'd have seen perhaps a dip off you know, in March, April or so when we, when we tend to see that dip happen. But because we did our flatten the curve suppression, stay home, stay home, safe, sheltering and all that, at the same time that you might see a seasonality to the virus, it is impossible to tell if there is any seasonality to the virus. The, if it was an experiment, it would have been a poorly set up one because there were too many independent variables that weren't controlled for. So um, right now, we, it, it, just the nature of when it hit um, and the suppression measures that were taken into place and the time of the year that we landed into make it very difficult at this point to say that there's, there's a seasonality to this virus. If it's like other coronaviruses and other respiratory viruses, probably so. We don't know yet. Well, thank you. And uh, I think I don't see any other questions. Um, but no, I, I just want to thank all the attendees. Thank you, Linda. Um, we were very blessed to have you here in our in our region, and especially during this time, at all times, but um, especially during this time. So thank you for all your work um, that you do for our county, and as well as the the relaunch Greater Lansing Task Force. For those that are still on, we do have two other um, two other um, webinars coming up: um, the proper cleaning, san san sanitizing uh, your workplace. It's going to be with Tico Duckett from Duckett Brothers, um, Duckett Brothers. That's this Tuesday, June 16th. And then we also have um, Plume uh, Service Company that's going to be talking about how you can improve your indoor air quality at your place of business. And that's on Wednesday, June 17th. But we'll send those out. And again, thank you, Linda. Did and thank you to Joni's all of our question? attendees. 
Did we answer Joni's question? Does self-screening meet the state of Michigan requirements? If we didn't, I, let me just answer that question and say, yes, it does. Just as long as you have a way to assure that your employee self-screened. So. Thank you. So um, other than that, enjoy your 11 minutes of uh, your Thursday and get outside and wear your mask and social uh, distance, of course, but um, enjoy the day and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.